want to first thank you for uh, indulging me to, uh, to speak tonight. I uh, actually asked Brother Rossman if he wouldn't mind. Uh, to be honest with you, uh, a year ago, uh, when we had the terrible tragic happens of Yeshiva, uh, in certain ways, it was one of the lowest points of my career, my life, uh, to be working with an institution, to be responsible for so many people, and then to lose one in so tragic a circumstance uh, takes its toll. In many ways, I've been dreading this date for a full year. Dreading it in many ways. Dreading it knowing that his family is still in pain. Well, so many of us have, have gone on with our lives, we've continued forward. And I want to speak a little bit about that tonight, a little bit about, not just from my beer but about what that means to me, and by extension, hopefully, to all of us. I also want to mention that, uh, although I don't always get over to this side of the building as often as I'd like, um, I just need to tell you, because I spend so much of my time on the road around the world, that there are so many fans that you have in so many cities. And Asia Torah is one of the, the largest, most widespread organizations probably in the world, and it's thanks to so many people. But everywhere I go, there are fans of you, the Tamidim. And so it's appropriate as we share, we come together as a family, Asia Torah, to, to mourn, to talk about this point that we sit together as a family here in Yeshiva in the base Manager. You know, in this week's parsha it starts by Echi. Rashi jumps up right away and points out that this is something called a stuma. That usually, when there is a break between Torah portions, there is a little bit of a spacing that one finds in the Torah. <coughs> but you don't find that by Echi. And Rashi right away comments on that, and he asks the question of why this is a stuma. And he says, that when Yaakov was about to die, he passes away in his parsha. He says that when Yaakov starts to pass away, that the Jewish people are aware that they are about to go into Shibud Mitzrayim. We are about to go into one of the lowest points in Jewish history. We're about to enter into a point where the Egyptians not only enslaved us, not only beat us, but literally killed babies. One of the low points in, in Jewish history. So there was depression, and it was understandable. But then it's so strange that the name of the Parsha should be Mayechi. Right? Why would you say, talk about, about Yaakov's life, should really focus on his death? It's a period of mourning, it's a dark period. And I think the answer is that for Jews, all the sorrow and the suffering that we go through, as long as there is a Jewish people, as long as the chain continues unbroken, and even though there's such sorrow, there's such pain, the fact that we know that the baton of the Torah could be transferred person to person and that the Messiah will continue, that's life by Yechi. Yaakov lived the life. Yes, he is passing away. Yes, this is a tough time. But look at Klai Yisrael. The Jewish people are starting to spread out. We now have tribes. We have children. We have babies. And it'll be difficult by, by Yechi. There'll still be life there. And we're sitting here a year later. It's such a strange time. We just fasted a Sarah Batavis, And that's the day after is when the terrible murder occurred. And a Sarah is such a strange fast. It's a strange fast because first of all, you have Hanukkah, we're celebrating everyone here, lit menorah, it was this beautiful light celebration. And here we are a few days later, we're mourning the destruction, but not exactly the destruction. And that's why this fast is different. It wasn't about the destruction, it was about the siege to Jerusalem. It was the start of the destruction. And I think that sitting here, literally, where those events occur, there is this strong symbolism to us that we celebrate Hanukkah. Sometimes as Jews, we end up on top physically and spiritually. 
And sometimes we wind up on the bottom. Sometimes we have to go through terrible, terrible physical pain, terrible mourning, terrible things. The Gemara Gavamus talks about that when you welcome a convert into the Jewish camp, it comments on the Gilles Rus and it talks about that Ruth, right? She's the basis of so many commandments surrounding how to bring in someone that's non Jewish to become Jewish. And the Gemara talks about how it's so important to tell them all the horrible things about Judaism and all the difficult things about Judaism. And you know, you think this thing's a party, you just wait. It's such a bizarre, such a bizarre way to do things. Someone is coming to the Jews. We have so few friends in the world. Someone's trying to, to come on our team, and you want to push them away, you want to tell them all the horrible things. Why would you do that? It's because we want to tell people the truth. So many times people see the beautiful side of Judaism, the celebrations. And my friend Rabbi Glasser pointed out to me today that when we say, when Ruth says, Ame, Ame, Melukaya, she says to Naomi, your God is my God. Those are all the good things. Yonta, Shabbos, all the great things. But she says, Ame, Ame. All the suffering of your nation are my suffering as well. And we need to always keep this in mind that there is this juxtaposition as Jews. And I'll never forget one of the most interesting situations I found myself in educationally many years ago, over 25 years ago. I was called upon in a camp to give a class, to give a Shabbos shiur, a Torah class at Shabbos. And it was on Sefer by Midbar, with the whole Sefer, in 45 minutes. And at some point, I talked about how, you know, difficult is to be Jewish, but you know, the different rebellions there, etc. And when I was done, the counselors in the camp came over to me, and of course, being young and arrogant, I thought they were going to give me a yashikov. And they come up to me and they say, you know, how could you do that? You ruined our summer. So what do you mean I ruined your summer? What did I do? They said, we spent the entire summer telling the, the, the campers how easy it is to be Jewish. And you just got up and told them how hard it is. You just destroyed everything we work for. And I said to them, don't lie to them. Don't pretend that being Jewish is some easy thing. Something that we just, you know, it's, oh, it's all parties and latkes and, and donuts. It is difficult to be a Jew. And we all say that as we grow older and we experience something like we experienced a year ago with our regular beer mopper. We realize how true that is. A year gone by, a year of someone that sat in that corner teaching Torah, no longer teaching Torah, a year gone by, where his family no longer gets to sit with him and celebrate with him. Why is it so difficult to internalize this? And I keep, I'm talking to myself more than I am you. For a year, I've been thinking, you know, I think about it often, but I don't think about it often enough. And I'm trying to understand my, for myself why that is. I wanted to share with you a story from Tanakh that I think explains a little bit the challenge. When Eliyahu and Nabi Elijah sticks up for God, and there are all these people out there doing idolatry, they're called the Nidia Baal, they worship something called Baal, the prophets of Baal. And Eliyahu needed to take a needed to take a drastic step to show the world that God existed. So Eliyahu and Nabi challenged these prophets of Baal to go to Mount Car Carmel, Har Carmel, and they would each give a sacrifice, and whoever gave the sacrifice that was accepted, you're the true God. Baal, you win great, I win the Almighty, great. So the story goes, the Nabi of Baal go there, and they try all day long, and they can't do anything, they can't get their sacrifice accepted. Comes Eli Elijah's turn, and he takes a bucket of water and dumps it over his sacrifice, just to make it a little more interesting, a little harder. And he says to the Almighty, I need you. 
and the sacrifice is accepted up, and the Jewish people, they scream out a phrase that should be familiar from Yom Kippur, Hashem Hu Elohim, Hashem Hu Elohim. That God is the true God. And they dispose of the Nevi, Abal, the prophets of Baal, and everyone's happy. Now that's the story that everyone gets told. What we focus on is the postscript. Right after this, the wicked queen, Isabel, Jezebel, she sends a messenger to Eliyahu. And the messenger says, she's coming for you, Queen uh, Isabel, Jezebel is coming for you, and she's going to kill you tomorrow. And Eliyahu and Abi runs away. And there are two powerful questions on that story. Number one is, why wouldn't she just kill him right then and there? Since when do you give someone a head start when you're trying to murder them? The second question is, where did Eliyahu go? The entire Jewish people just said, Hashem Hu Elohim, Hashem Hu Elohim. They were on his side. Why did he run? And the answer is that both Izebel and Eliyahu knew the same thing to be true. That inspiration, that feelings, emotions are fleeting. Today, yes, Hashem Elohim, Hashem Elohim, we're behind you, Elio. But tomorrow, I have a family, I have a job, I have school. I've got stuff to do. And Elio knew she was right and ran away. And it's an amazing thing about the human psyche. That inspiration and outrage, it's fleeting. It comes. And when we are outraged, when we are angry, when we are hurt, there's nothing more powerful. But then it goes away. And here we are, one year, exactly one year that the attack happened on our Rebbe. When he was killed and over Ben Ari, it started to came to his aid. Two holy men struck down. One year exactly from that attack. That four soldiers are killed, are run over. Four soldiers, age 20, three of them age 20, one of them age 22. The same age as many of us in this room. One year later, and we probably felt outrage again. And then a day goes by. Then another day goes by. And then the outrage dissipates till the next attack. Why do we function like this? So I want to give someone a muscle, which I heard many, many years ago, a parable, which helped me to understand this and helped me to understand a lot of Judaism. And it's a parable, it's a not true, but it's a story, I think, that helped me really come to terms with, with the way emotions work in Judaism and how to, to keep them going. There was a story told, it was a great rabbi of Kubal, and he was traveling around, and this rabbi stopped in at a faraway farm. There was no one else around there, a Jew. He found a Jew, and he asked the Jew if he could stay overnight. And the farmer said, absolutely, it would be my pleasure. I don't really know many Jews. I don't see many Jews. Please stay in my home. And he said the next morning he got up, and the farmer got up to Dab, and he watched the farmer Dab. He said the farmer had a very thick siddur, a very thick prayer book, and the farmer would start with chakras to morning prayers. And then he would go on to the afternoon and evening prayers. Then he would say the Shabbos prayers. And then he would say Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur prayers. And then he would say Pesach, Shavuos, and Sukkot prayers. And then he would say Tishlev. And literally, he took one of those thick sidurim, one of those thick prayer books, and he read it through from beginning to end. And the rabbi comes to him after and said, what are you doing? It took him a few hours. He said, what do you mean? I'm praying. I have this book. I know I'm a Jew. I know I pray, but this is all I know. The rabbi said, let me, let me just teach you something. At different times of the year, he explained it to him. They put bookmarks inside, and he, he gave him the sitter, and the rabbi went on his way, and the farmer, this would cut down, obviously, on a lot of time, make it easier, simpler, easier to focus, and they parted ways. The farmer's about to pick up his door. He's so excited that his hands shake, and he drops it, and sure enough, all the bookmarks fall out. And so he chases after the rabbi, and this rabbi is all the way down at the river, and he, this, the rabbi is a very, very holy rabbi. He 
creates a great miracle and he floats over the river and keeps walking. Well, now the farmer has a problem. If he has to go run all the way down to the bridge, he's not going to be able to catch him. He says, I'll, I'll try the same thing the rabbi did. So he gets to the, to the river. Sure enough, he floats over the river, catches up to the rabbi. The rabbi says to him, he says, well, where did you just come from? He says, oh, you don't understand. I dropped my bookmarks. I need help, help, help. You know, he says, no, no, but hang on. I understand all that, but how did you get across that river? He said, oh, what do you mean? I saw you perform that great miracle, so I performed that great miracle. So the rabbi said, I'm not going to help you. He says, what are you talking about? He said, because the way you pray and the holiness that you obviously contain within is the real way that every human being should operate. Every single day of the year, we should feel Rosh Hashanah in our heart. We should feel like God is judging us. Every day of the year, we should feel happiness of Sukkot. Every day of the year, we should feel the shame and, and the terrible days of Tishua where the base of Israel was destroyed. Every day, we should feel all of these emotions. But we're human. And God understood that. And therefore, the Almighty Hashem created a year where the emotions were spaced out. Where there was a time in the summer to mourn the base of English. Where there was a time of Elul, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, to pray to Hashem for forgiveness. That there was a sukkah to celebrate. That's the way the Almighty created, because normal human beings couldn't feel all those emotions. I want to be personal just for a moment and talk about why I joined Eshet Torah. I came to Eshet Torah because the more I looked into Eshet Torah, I realized that Eshe Torah was created and started by a man that could feel all those emotions. Eshe Torah was started by Rav Noah Weinberg. Rav Noah Weinberg was a person that every day felt those emotions. He felt the emotions that the Jews had a spiritual crisis. And every day he would tell his students, his Talmudim, and today, if you speak to any one of them, they will tell you, they hear his words, they see his fingers pointing about taking responsibility for the spirituality of the Jewish people. And this yeshiva stands to remind us to take that responsibility to all the Jewish people that don't know a word of Torah. But it didn't stop there. From Noah took responsibility for the physical safety of the Jewish people. Just like Moshe Rabbeinu was the person Moses got us the Torah, gave us the Torah, but he also saved us from Egypt. And in 2001, Rav Noah stood here during the Intifada and he talked about the fact that right out the window you can see terrible things happening and he asked everyone to take a half an hour to think about what they could do. And Rabbi Eli Mathias on Friday night speaking to a Hasbro Fellowship group told that story and said he sat and he thought and he thought and he thought and he came up with an idea called Hasbro Fellowships. And he started in 2001 and as he tells the story, he came to tell Rav Noah that he got funding from the Israeli government. Rav Noah was so excited, he slapped him across the cheek. And Elliot said that was one of the greatest moments of his life. And here we are 15 years later that Rabbi Elliot Mathias has taken thousands upon thousands of Jewish kids on campuses who are far away from Judaism many times and taught them to care about their Jewish brothers and sisters. That is a definition of a gadol of the Jewish people. What does it mean to be a Gogol, a great man, a great rabbi? It means that you care about every Jew. You care about it spiritually and physically. I once was Zoka, I once had the great merit to visit the Lubavitcher Rebbe. You would go and you would sit on this enormous line to get a dollar. You would give every Jew a dollar in Brooklyn, you would walk through, walk through. And I waited, we waited hours to, to meet this great Gogol. And they asked the Lubavitcher Rebbe, they said, don't, and he would stand the entire time. They said, don't you get tired standing there all day long as everyone's coming by for a brother. And Lubavitcher Shurebi said, he said, when someone is counting diamonds, they don't get tired. Great men, Gedolim, great Jews, they care about every Jew. And they feel these emotions every day. And Asha Torah, Asha Torah, the, the Torah, what does it mean to be Asha? We talk about it all the time. It's not just a specific Torah. It is a state of mind. Asha 
Torah, Yeshiva Eish Torah, is built as a place that we care about every Jew. That every day we think about, we look in the mirror, we take the time, as Rav told us, to think about how we can help the Jewish people spiritually. How we can help the Jewish people physically. How we can take on the burden of the Jewish people and to make sure that they are safe. To make sure that they are spiritual. Make sure that they are inspired. This is our mission. This is not any other yeshiva. We sit here in the walls that were destroyed hundreds of years ago. And we're here to say that we are back. You can destroy the base of Middash. You can destroy the walls of Yishalayim. But you cannot destroy the heart and soul of the Jewish people. Vayichim. Yaakov may be dead. But his sons were not. And because his sons were gone, Egypt could take their worst shot at us. And we're here today. So as we commemorate Rabbi, Rabbi Birmacher, who sat in that corner, and every day it pains my heart that I didn't know him better. I wasn't here for that long when he passed away. But you talk to his Talmud, and you talk to his students. I was just talking to Rabbi Femia Coopersmith, who related in one of his articles a story about Rabbi Birmacher, one of the students that came to his funeral, who was not a student of his. And they said, why are you here? He said, well, I was once in the Kadarovel, and the food wasn't that great. I'm sure they'll surprise most of you. He said, the food wasn't that great, and I was complaining about it. And when Birmacher took me out, and he didn't know who I was, and he bought me a falafel. He said, how can I not come to the Levi of a man like that? And I keep thinking in my mind the fact that a daughter of his got married and he wasn't standing there on the hook. His son was bar mitzvah and he wasn't putting tefillin on him. And not only Rabir Macher, over Ben Ari, there was another man who saw what was going on and without thinking he didn't have a gun. He jumped with his bare hands and jumped out to run to try and save Rabbi Bir Macher. And he was killed. Who was Ofer Ben Ari? He was a man that owned a recording studio that used to give it to teens at risk for free. He's a man that owned underground property that used to give it out to homeless people for free. These are two heroes of the Jewish people. Rabbi Birmacher, who sat in that corner every day caring for the spiritual welfare of every single Jew, and Ofer Ben Ari who saw another Jew in physical trouble, and jumped out of his car, didn't think twice, and leaves two daughters, two teenage daughters behind. So this 25 hours, these 25 hours, it's time to focus. It's time to feel. We can't read news articles about soldiers being run over by trucks and people being murdered in the streets without our, ha our heart pounding in our chest to do something. We need to spend this next 24, 25 hours focused on Rabir Mahar, focused on Ofer Ben Ari, focused on these four soldiers, focused on the Jewish people, focused on Eshet Torah. And then every day after that, it doesn't have to be every day like it was for Noah, it'll take you a little bit of time to get to that level. But every day, set aside time. Set aside time to think in the schools of these sadikim. What are we going to do to change the world? How are we finally going to stop these horrible, horrendous people who pick on us just because we're Jews? This is nothing new. We've been going through this for hundreds of years, for thousands of years. What are we going to do? Are we going to learn more Torah in Rabir Mahmoud's memory? Are we going to figure out what we can do to, to make the Jewish people safe? And so we're going to start we're going to start off the yurt site by walking. I know it's cold. Apologize. A little Messiah Snefesh is, uh, is good to keep us thinking. But we're going to walk to the site where he was killed. And everyone, says, please focus on Rabbi Mahar. Focus on the Kiddush Hashem he made. Focus on Ofer Ben Ari who jumped out of his car and ran to save another Jew without thinking. Focus, focus, focus. That's what Asia Torah is about. Asia Torah is about not forgetting who we are or what we can achieve. Thank you.